everybody. Happy Friday and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Sinead DeFries, and this is The Daily Show, where we bring you the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us this morning is your Collider Movie Talk crew. First up, senior producer, John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. A little bit of a spoiler into what's coming later on in the show. Mockingjay Part 2 sucks. <laughs> 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 also, also here, it's Josh McCuga. I was so looking forward to mocking Jay Part 2, and then you just crushed me. Hey, guys, how's it going? And it's Christian Harloff. Well, I'll say this about it. I didn't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. Well, listen, as happens sometimes, a little something drop before we got started on the show today. As you remember, yesterday's show, we talked a little bit about the new pictures that came out for the new Kevin Hart, Dwayne The Rock Johnson film, Central Intelligence. Well, the trailer drop dropped this morning, and we just sat around and watched it. Christian, you saw. What are your thoughts on the new Central Intelligence trailer? Uh, it's the same as when I saw the poster, is that you know, I, The Rock made this trailer for me. He really did, and I like when he plays this version of kind of the the cocky arrogant uh doesn't give a crap about anybody but himself i guess he was a, a bully slob and he winds up uh you know now Rocking. yeah now he becomes like the rock and he's just taking kevin hart on, on this adventure there are some parts that look really funny and there's some parts that could look really stupid and it could be one of those movies that you walk out going wow that was i was surprised i liked the director i, I enjoyed we're the millers i thought that was a funny movie yeah, me um too. but this uh I, I don't know i i got some chuckles out of it but it looks pretty generic for the most part. You know, we talked about those pictures on yesterday's show, and I said, look, I'm a big fan of The Rock. Everybody knows that. And I am i haven't gotten tired. At some point, I'll get tired of Kevin Hart's shtick, but so far I haven't. I am still find him really entertaining. I'm a fan of both these guys, but the pictures and the sound of the movie just sounded bad. I sold it. I'm on board now. <laughs> I, I am totally on board now. Now that I get a feel for what it is they're going for, yeah. and, and you really can't until you see the trailer, and once you do, I, in the first 10 seconds of the trailer, I'm like, oh, this is as bad as we thought. And then the first joke dropped. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, all right. And then uh, it just right up to the fat Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. That even worked. For, that worked for me. The Rock's delivery was on point. Oh, yeah. Trailer. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. And suddenly I went from yesterday said, this sounds bad. The pictures look bad. And now I'm totally on board with it. So if you haven't seen the trailer, I suggest you do. Makuga, what did you think about I, it? You know, I, I watched yesterday's show. I... This mo none of the posters really got me excited, but you remember in the other guys when The Rock and Samuel L. Jackson the best part, part, of the part of the movie uh. and they jump from that thing. Uh. This kind of looks what that's going to be like, but an extended version of that The Rock character of like a cocky CIA agent that's also maybe a little stupid, which I enjoy. I, and <laughs> The Rock, like he can't do anything wrong at this point. He is just hitting everything out of the ballpark. And like you said, I'm not tired of Kevin Hart yet. Maybe I will be soon, but I'm not tired of him yet. So I'm buying. Because Kevin it Hart me. does have that on-screen shtick yeah. that you figure will work for a movie or two. But I've seen him now in like five or six or seven. And so far, it's still working for me. Yeah, but you know, the thing with this, and this this kind of proves the point, is that he's, as where The Rock is changing up and doing different things yes, in every he movie he yeah. does, yeah. Kevin Hart is doing the same thing over and over and over again. And he was overshadowed by The Rock in this trailer. And he's like the comedy guy. Mm -hmm. The Rock is the guy who's kind of right now is the chameleon and doing everything. And because of that, because he keeps doing the same shtick, it looks like all the funny moments were not from the comedian, they were from The Rock. Well, then, but let's remember too that, you know, The Rock comes from a background of like multi-level entertainment charisma. Kevin Hart is a comedian, he's a yeah. stand-up comedian. And as we all know, anybody who is or was stand-up comedians are vastly more limited in their skill set. To what, oh, oh, wait, wait, sorry. Let's address that later. All right, what's our first official story of the day? To wipe your ass with that hat. <laughs> In a new candid interview with The Hobbit director Peter Jackson and second unit director Andy Serkis, which can be found on the Blu-ray of The Hobbit, The Battle of the Five Armies, Jackson reveals that for much of the production of the films, he was just, quote, winging it. The director was working 21 hour days due to the fact that they had lost a year and a half of prep time and that scenes were being shot without being properly written to his satisfaction, without storyboards and basically without a plan. Despite the fact that the Hobbit trilogy made nearly three billion dollars worldwide. John, what was your take on this Peter Jackson interview? Uh, first of all, really surprising and refreshing how candid it uh -huh. was. I mean, literally, it's it's 
minutes of Peter Jackson just saying, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, so the basic scenario is, look, for those of you who don't know, and most of you do, I know, but, you know, Guillermo del Toro for like almost two years was going to be the director of the Hobbit films. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the schedules got worked out and he eventually had to leave because they couldn't start it on time. Peter Jackson jumped in. And he tells, if you haven't seen the video of him talking, he basically tells a story about how we were on set and I didn't have storyboards, didn't have planned out. We were just kind of winging, oh, do this, uh, maybe do that. And because it was like that, he was like working 21 hour days and all that kind of stuff. And you go from thinking, on one point of view, you could go from thinking, you know, I, you know, and I'm somebody who did like the Hobbit trilogy. I did. I liked the Hobbit trilogy, but it was such a step backwards from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And it's one of those films where even though I liked it, I would never debate somebody who said they didn't like it because I can totally see why they didn't like it, even though I enjoyed it myself. But when you're watching the Hobbit trilogy, you know, you and then you watch this interview, you go from thinking... Wow, how did Peter Jackson mess this one up to how on earth did he pull this off at all? And, you know, I'm reading a lot of commentators this morning about that whole thing. It's like, wow, Peter Jackson's really amazing that he was able to pull this off despite the fact that they didn't have it, the script where they wanted, all that kind of stuff. But what I haven't heard anybody ask, and I've got to bring up this question, you know, while Guillermo del Toro was the director on the film for a year and a half, Peter Jackson was the producer. And working with Guillermo del Toro. And in this video, Peter Jackson says, well, you know, once Guillermo left, I had to start it all over again. Because I had a different vision for the movie. I had a different this and a different that. And they reworked the scripts and they had to totally read. And then you see set designers talking about we had to totally redesign all the sets. And I'm the only question I come away with is why? Why? You were, I mean, I understand a director has their own vision. But you were working with Guillermo del Toro on this. You were already a year and a half into it. Either you believed in it or you didn't. And if you did believe in it, granted, maybe it won't be your thumbprint on it, but you, for the good of the movie, you get it done. So I found it to be very fascinating. I love Peter Jackson's candor in it, but I was the big question that was left to me was, why did you start from scratch when you had a year and a half of work? You did it, okay, you slept, you only slept three hours a day, but you did it to yourself. I, I just, this is the part that's bugging me right now. I know a Christian, you saw the interview. What stood out to you and what, thoughts does it leave you with you shall not write <laughs> um it is uh it, it's it's like you said it's, it's very nice to see how candid he was too it makes a lot of sense when you look at as far i mean i still there was still that planning and you know the, probably the extra cgi because we were without spoiling we were looking at i've been looking at lord of the rings footage lately right. um and in looking of and that lord of the rings footage i was kind of shocked to find out there was very little use of cgi in that movie very little it was mostly models miniatures all that stuff too and i wonder if peter jackson had more time if he would have used more of that stuff because it clearly saved him a lot of time to over CGI it and put CGI orcs in instead of my one complaint has always been I thought that it was so much more effective to have people dressed as orcs and like, those, right. like that was but the reason why he did that and put the, them in there is maybe to save himself some time in regards to your question which I think is a great question with uh, del Toro and it's what we've heard from del Toro is del Toro has a very specific style visions oh, that he likes much we so, also yeah. don't know and we've also heard many times where leaving because of schedule also could have had a conversation with Peter Jackson. This is not this is this doesn't this looks significantly different. Your version of the Hobbit movies looks so much different from what we're tying in here to Lord of the Rings. It's not working out. Maybe that was part of it. We don't know. I mean, it could have been in those conversations. It could have. And but then, he, he left the Hobbit, and, the, and then he immediately started Pacific Rim, didn't yeah, he? Not? Yeah. Like, right. so, so, it, so I always bought, even though you're absolutely right, whenever you hear due to scheduling conflicts, but I, I always, my impression, but maybe you're right, my impression of it has always been this is one of those legitimate times because he was sitting and waiting to start shooting the Hobbit, and then he just couldn't wait anymore. But, it was either that or lose Pacific Rim. But it was also, yeah, but, yeah, but well, it's listen, the Hobbit versus yeah, Pacific right. Rim. That's, I mean, that's, and, that was and, his. It was project, his, it was his baby, yeah. but it's also, this is, this is the the at the time the the prequel to Lord of the Rings which is one of the most beloved trilogies yeah. of all time and you and everyone was oh, doing Hobbit movies and Del Toro's doing it Del Toro something must have happened I think I mean this is just speculation but I think something must have happened to where the style of what uh, a Del Toro movie is a Del Toro movie mm -hmm. and you you see it no matter and and I think that it needs to, it just needed to be a Hobbit movie so maybe that's why and then Jackson wanted to restart it all over again and had to start from scratch so I understand how that happened but I do think it's very refreshing and makes a lot of sense that he made these comments 
I think uh, I, I I know I'm in a minority here uh, that I watch The Strain on FX. I know a lot of people don't watch that. I watched shit. season one. Did you watch season one? Yeah, I did okay. mind season one actually. Yeah. Um, I've I've watched all the episodes. It's it's, it's okay, but it, it does have that very Del Toro effect. Like it is a very singular show, and I th- and. When you're doing a, a movie like The Hobbit, because I really liked the first one. After that, I felt like it went off, which sounds like just exhaustion of mm. the movie. And the first one, like like The Lord of the Rings, is a lot of walking and a lot of just like singular characters. When you start adding in all of the war stuff and, and the choreographing and the writing and the doing of all those scenes, if you're not 100% in it and you don't have a plan going into it, you're going to fail. Like yeah. It's like any wartime kind of a but, thing. But it didn't really, necessarily, the movie didn't fail though. I mean, as far as box office, three no, billion course, dollars. Course, but I know yeah. what you mean. I know what you mean. You mean, you mean more about like, right. You, right? It didn't hold up to Lord of the Rings. Right. Right. Exactly. Where, it, and it sh- and it could have and should have. Right. Even though it's one book, that book, The Hobbit, is way more popular in terms of people who have read them than the Lord of the Rings books. Because you read it in school, a lot of school kids read The Hobbit, and those that was one of those books where I was like, oh, they're making Hobbit movies. This is going to be incredible. I watched the first one. I, I was, was like, so okay. excited. So excited. So excited. And then, should have been two movies. Should have been yeah. two movies. Yeah. And because the third one, it just, it just, it really did feel improv. But now we know why. Yeah. After watching this, because in this video, I was talking about, look, they were trying to film the big battle of the five armies, right? And they've got Andy Serkis, who was the second unit director. And Andy Serkis is saying, yeah, we had no idea what the battle was. So we were just shooting battle scenes, having no idea what was going yeah. on. And, and you can tell it looked like and that. And it did look like yeah. that. And, he's, and then Peter Jackson just basically said, you know what? This is going to be a total mess unless we just take a break. And that, all we are left to now deduce is that is what led to the decision. Well, then let's make it three movies right. and give you that extra time, which is a terrible reason to have it break that mm-hmm. that uh, series into three movies instead right. of two. But, you know, very insightful, very cool to hear a lot of this stuff. So uh, it was a good interview. If you haven't seen it, check it out. It, it's It's very revealing. All right, what's next? Last night in theaters across the country, the final installment of the Hunger Games series, The Hunger Games Mockingjay Part 2, debuted. Uh, Christian and John, you guys have both seen the movie, so starting with Christian, what is your review on the final Hunger Games movie? And here we go. (laughs) Um, I I enjoyed the movie. I liked liked the movie. The problem with the movie for me was Mm -hmm. it's very faithful to the book. And the book to me, which is strange. Normally, you hear that it wasn't faithful <laughs> to the book. And the book out of the out of the three books, this book is my least favorite out of the three of them. I also thought that there were a lot of reveals in the book, without spoiling anything, that I thought were handled poorly. I thought that some of the reveals that while I was reading in the book, I'm like, wait, what? And I go back and read it again. No way. It's it was glossed over very fast. Happened about two or three times, and then there are other really big reveals that in the book. Didn't see it coming at all, and then it was kind of telegraphed, and you're like, oh, uh, okay. So people who haven't seen it knew that was, and who hadn't read the books knew that was coming. It was, um, it, yeah, and it, and it was dreary. I thought they could have done more to maybe go away from the book and enhance the story a bit more. But I did find myself still watching Jennifer Lawrence's Katniss because I think this this character has taken us through four movies um, and I, I wanted to see it I wanted to see it wrapped up I thought it wrapped up as well as they could with the with, with the book so it, it was disappointing it wasn't as great as I wanted it to be but I still wound up saying it's it's a fine movie I hated this yeah. movie <laughs> I, know I hated this movie and I surprisingly so I really like all the other ones I even like the last one the one that a lot of people didn't like I even like that one and this was one of the most this was singularly the most boring movie I saw this year like without a doubt with the exception of the sewer scene yeah. which which I thought was very well done actually that, that was one scene that was very well done we had we're even in the books Katniss Everdeen did you read the books I did read okay. the books um even in the books, Katniss Everdeen is not a likable, like a, an overly likable character. She's anti-hero. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of anti-hero. Yeah. In the movie, she's absolutely unlikable uh, in many ways. But, I mean, the way all the exposition, the exposition was done was just always drab and dull. I understand the world is drab. I get that. But then you have to have moments in there to color it a bit. This was a great exam. I'm so glad you brought up that the, the fact that it is a faithful adaptation for the most part, and that's a negative thing. Yeah. This was a great example of how something can work great on the page, 
but you have to adapt it and change it up for it to work on the screen. Because on the page, it was written for the page, not for a visual medium. And then when you brought it into a visual medium, it's like whatever. It's like you can tell from the trailer. This isn't a big spoiler. You can tell this from the trailers. Now the armies of the United Districts are attacking the Capitol. This thing we've been waiting four movies for. Do you see any of it? Nope. Do you see any of that battle? Nope, no. Then you see, but John, that's the way it was in the book. Well, that's a great example where you gotta adapt the yeah. Yeah. damn we, book. We, right. mm -hmm. um, where you gotta adapt the book. You talked about a couple of the reveals. There's several very key important things that happen that are so botched yeah. in the movie, they carried no emotional impact whatsoever. And you wanna complain about 50 endings to Lord of the Rings Return of the King? Try watching Mockingjay part two. <laughs> And only th I didn't care about anything that was going on in any of these endings. Mm -hmm. I was so thoroughly disappointed. And part of my disappointment, no, all of my disappointment <laughs> is rooted in the fact that I really did like the other movies. Right. And I just thought, I, this is going to be in, by the end of the year, this is going to be in my top five worst films wow. of the year. Wow, top five. Top five wow. worst films of the year to wow. me. I didn't see it, obviously, I haven't seen it yet. But I thought after I walked out of part one, See, like when I when I walked out of the Mocking J Part Mock, One, Mocking right. J Part One. When I walked out of Harry Potter, yeah. the Part One, the last one, I was like, "Great, this should be two movies." When I walked out of Part One, I was like, "They should have just put another hour on Part One and made it a three and a half hour movie, and I would have been okay with that." Because, like you said, the third book is my least favorite, um, and it could have been the Battle for Hogwarts. Good, right? And they just they didn't do that in the book, and I've been like. I haven't had a ton of excitement because Mockingjay Part 1 was great, but I was like, you could have wrapped it up in another hour and I'd have been fine with it. I think you could have as well, too, but I, I do think that I understand. I thought I, I really enjoyed Mockingjay Part 1, um, but yeah, Part 2, it's funny, we were just talking about Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings took a lot of right turns away from from uh, from the books, yeah. and it worked brilliantly. Perfectly, It worked yeah. really well because... They're, they're, and. Unlike The Hobbit, they had mm -hmm. enough time to work on it, really prepare. And I think that part part of that is that they had to rush out these movies. We needed to come out in 2014. We needed to come out in 2015. And it's like take your time on it, or maybe like Josh was saying, make it one big movie. Uh, you know, make it a, make it a longer movie if you have to, and change it up a bit. And I would I agree with you. I would have liked to seen that fight between the people in the Capitol and yeah. and you know the resistance. So yeah, it was. I understand the disappointment. Like I said though, I didn't I didn't hate it. All right. Well, listen, folks, we reached that part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, sinead has got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell. So, Sinead, what do we got? According to a report in Variety, Mission Impossible Rogue Nation director Christopher McQuarrie is in talks to both write and direct the sixth Mission Impossible film. This would make McQuarrie the first director to helm two of the Mission Impossible movies. McQuarrie has a long-standing working relationship with Tom Cruise as he has either directed or written or both such Cruise films as Valkyrie, Jack Reacher, Edge of Tomorrow, and of course, Rogue Nation. Josh, do you buy or sell Christopher McQuarrie returning to direct Mission Impossible 6? I think I'm going to sell it um, because I didn't love Rogue Nation. I, I really enjoyed Ghost Protocol. I can't stand Valkyrie. Really liked Edge of Tomorrow. I'm like somewhere in the middle. I always like when a new director steps onto a Mission Impossible movie because they bring in a new blood. They bring in a new aspect to the movie because it's not... It's not a James Bond kind of thing where there's a source material and there's something that we have to to uh, you know stick on course with with a James Bond movie. Mission Impossible, you can do whatever you want. So it's always cool to bring in a new face, new name, new energy to that franchise. I'm going to sell. A weak sell, but sell. I am massively buying this uh, because I, unlike you, I love Valkyrie. I think that is one of Cruz's most underappreciated films. As a matter of fact, I was a big fan of Jack Reacher, uh, a little bit more than Christian Harloff. Um, <laughs> I and I've liked I've liked everything these two dudes have done to get with Tom Cruise and Christopher that they have worked in unison on so far. It surprisingly, look, all of us went into the last Mission Impossible film. Look, it doesn't have to be as good as five. Or what? Wait a minute. Was four. This four. Four. Yeah. No, that Doesn't, was five. That was five. Was this one just five? That was five. This, this was one was five. five. So, okay. just so we all went five. into five and said, Rogue this Nation one doesn't five. have to be as good as four. We just hope it's really good because it's not going to be as good as four. You can't possibly be as good as four. And it was better than four. And that blew us all away. So for him to come now, I wouldn't want to see him do three, four, five movies because I'm like you a lot. I mm -hmm. like it when uh, directors will keep themselves fresh and mm -hmm. not stay on one franchise for too long. But 
two films in a row, I can stay on board for two films in a row. So for me, it's going to be a buy. Huge buy for me. I love the fact that Macquarie's coming back. I, Rogue Nation's my favorite out of out of all of them. Really? Yeah. It's. Wow. Uh, I I thought it was just such a great. I think it was the best. Uh, I, you guys did the all the spy films that came out. You guys ranked the spy films. Yeah. I wasn't able to be on that panel, but Rogue Nation was also in my number one As so well, far too. Yeah. yeah. It just it was such a great follow up, and I loved Ghost Protocol. Yeah, me too. But I think that what Macquarie and Tom Cruise did, they they have a really great working relationship relationship right now and they're they're collaborating really well and i think that because this one was received so well by critics by by fans it makes a lot of sense to bring them back and they, and they obviously they have another story they, they have another arc that they want to tell together which i think really works and they're they're, they're working on what is it the sequel to edge of tomorrow together and yeah. doing jack reaches so it why not if if the, if the, these guys want to make movies together and they want to continue telling the story of ethan hunt and furthering what we just got then yeah it's a huge buy from it's like Tony Scott and Denzel Washington. You yeah, know, or when they yeah, were working together, right. there were some brilliant speeches. Leo, those Martin two. Scorsese. I, was, I, mean, I just want to defend my Valkyrie real quick. The only reason I didn't like that movie is they didn't speak in German accents, or there wasn't well, yeah, much German yeah. to it. That's the only reason I really. Yeah, that's a valid point. Had, but all right, what's next? The first trailer for the upcoming Melissa McCarthy comedy, The Boss, has just hit the web. The Boss stars McCarthy as a titan of industry who is sent to prison after she's caught for insider trading. When she emerges, ready to rebrand herself as America's latest sweetheart, not everybody that she screwed over is so quick to forgive and forget. John, do you buy or sell the first trailer for The Boss? You know, Central Intelligence, we saw some pictures and went, meh, and then I saw the trailer, I'm like, yeah! When I heard about The Boss and saw the first couple of images, I was like, hey, this could be good, then I saw the trailer, sell. <laughs> Sell this trailer. That I I am a Melissa McCarthy fan. I enjoy her work very much. Nothing, and I even like uh, oh Dak Shepard's wife, uh, Kristen Bell. Chris, Kristen I, Bell. I, I like Kristen Bell very mm -hmm. much. I love her in House of Lies oh, too. I was gonna say House of Lies, she's fantastic. But no, just no. <laughs> just I'm, I'm gonna sell this. Josh, what about you? <laughs> this is a sell. It's all <laughs> I don't <laughs> like. It starts. What if they were speaking in German accents? Uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, buy it, buy it. Yeah. You know, it starts out of like, okay, this is a, a, a typical Melissa McCarthy character. The hair is funny. She's this badass, and then it just goes into like a rejected troop Beverly Hills like where did this yeah. come from uh, yeah I, I don't know I, it's, it's it's a sell it's a hard sell <laughs> garbage <laughs> it is a big sell for me this is look I, I got some hey, hey Josh I got, I got an idea yeah what's that Chris all right so how about how about a comedy here we have this okay. comedy okay. and yeah you put up the the, the, the troopers and, and they're with Melissa McCarthy Ooh. but wait get this get this Ooh. a fight breaks out what? It's not like Anchorman very different oh. but just like Anchorman okay and and they, and they fight and then they just the girls fight we have girls Get fighting. Out of here. Hilarious. Buy it. It's Buy it. so <laughs> stupid. It's like it's it's just generic garbage over and over again. Guess what? We just got this bad movie. Get hard with with Will Ferrell and Kevin Hart. Yeah. It was the same thing. It's yeah. this rich person, rich person who's a moron goes, and then what happens? Then she gets in trouble, and now she's gotta she's gonna learn about humanity. But the wearing berets, really, Christian. Oh, you're right. Make it. Do it. Do it. <laughs> so it's just a dumb, dumb premise, and it's the same. I like Melissa McCarthy also. Yeah. The problem is, and I also love. Ben Falcone is an actor. Yeah. Dude's got to stop directing. I yeah. uh, haven't seen this movie yet. I could change my tune, but it seems like, hey, honey, I, uh, I need I need to work. You want to direct my next movie? Sure. Okay, good. <laughs> and they, because the, that last movie they did together. What, oh, uh, the one with the... Uh, uh, the Tammy. Tammy. Uh, oh, God. Gosh. Two, two in a row. It's just, Well, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm saying that without seeing the movie, so it's unfair, but from what we've seen in this trailer, this trailer is just... It, I didn't laugh once. And no. what's up with every movie they do together? She wears some sort of neck gear. Like yeah. in Tammy, she was wearing a neck brace the whole time. This one, she has long turtlenecks. Yeah. And she falls and she gets thrown into something. Yeah. And, now, yeah. though, as somebody who once worked for the WWE, yeah. surely mm -hmm. you can appreciate that sweet clothesline she gave the little girl. You have, she always <laughs> fights. I'll, I'll give her that. She I'll does, give her that. The, she, but that's the thing. She, it's like if you put a trailer together, if somebody out there, there's so many amazing editors who watch this well, too, you put together clips from Melissa McCarthy's movies, you can find about 50 falls, mm -hmm. you can find about 100 fights, yeah. you can find the F-bomb, you could put together and her she's insulting a child to its face. Every right. single movie that she's done, it's going right back to the Kevin Hart thing too, and I like Melissa McCarthy. Mm. I thought it was a little bit of, a, I thought she took a bit of a departure in Spy, which yeah, I, I liked. It. Spy was very different because it wasn't that obnoxious yeah. She's so thing. good in St. Vincent, and I know that's not a comedy, but still, she she's was, so right, lovable right. in that and movie. You know, and but, she, but, she was funny in, in yeah, St. Vincent too, was. and, and I, what was the one she just did with Jason Bateman? It was a big box Office hit. The thief, the identity thief. Uh, no, uh, identity thief. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I actually quite liked yeah, her. I, I liked her more than she I was liked the movie. in that one too. Like yeah. I like I, going off of your point, Josh. I would like to see her. I think that it's time for her now to 
let's see the dramatic chops. Let's do what Jim Carrey did and, and Steve Carell is doing now too. Yeah. Hit the dramatic role because you know you. I know that the bread and butter is is the comedy, but it's it's repetitive. At this what point. what's that stupid TV show with the mom and her daughter Mike that every and Molly, girl likes? Mom? No, 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 no. The the mom and the Gilmore daughter. Gilmore Girls. Gilmore Girls. Oh, yeah. Maybe she can go back to Gilmore. Maybe she'll be <laughs> she in that Gilmore Girls yes. reunion yes. thing. Yes. yes. All right. What's next? It's been announced that writer-director Edgar Wright will take on an upcoming DreamWorks animation feature film based on Shadows. Wright will both direct and co-write the project, which will mark his first animated feature film. Wright's previous films include Shaun of the Dead, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, The World's End, and Hot Fuzz. Christian, do you buy or sell Edgar Wright taking on a DreamWorks animated feature? Oh, big buy. Yeah, man, I want to see. What it, it's it's shadows. What is it about? Who the hell knows? It's Edgar Wright, though. It's going to be creative. It's going to be fun. Um, and DreamWorks needs it. It's DreamWorks, yeah? Yeah. yeah. The DreamWorks needs it. You know, a nice, uh, to, to put his name on it, he's another guy that when he gets involved with, with a project, it's not just to take a job. It's because he's going to put his heart and soul in it, and he's going to put his creative flavor into it, and you're going to know that it's an Edgar Wright project. So, yeah, I buy it. Yeah, I buy it, too. I, you, Edgar Wright is one of my favorite artistic directors, really. And even with comedy and even with what some people would consider when he does what some people would consider lowbrow comedy, he brings an artistic mm -hmm. angle to it that I just appreciate so much. I've never seen him do animation for this. is interesting. The one little asterisk I'll put beside this, I'll be curious if this movie actually gets made because DreamWorks has been laying people off left right yeah. and center lately. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if the movie even actually happens. But taking it at face value, you got to buy it, I guess. Josh, what about you? Yeah, I, I mean, Scott Pilgrim versus the World has some animated stuff to it. I yes. mean, it's basically yeah. a video game. I love that movie. Uh, I do too. And you know what? The cool thing, I love animated movies that tear at adult heart, heartstrings as well as mm -hmm. child heartstrings. Because that way, when you go to a movie with your three-year-old nep nephew and niece, it's a cool thing for you to go see too. You don't have to sit through sit through crap. If you're giving me Edgar Wright doing an animated movie, buy it. it sounds awesome. And I'm sure Simon Pegg is going to have some sort of yeah, creative voice, voice it, in yeah. it. You know, yeah. so great. I love it. Love the idea. All right, what's next? With the world waiting for a official confirmation on a new Indiana Jones movie, another film franchise may be popping up its head to fill in the void. According to a report on the tracking board, Chris Hemsworth is apparently in talks to potentially star in a new Alan Quartermain movie. John, would you buy or sell a new Alan Quartermain franchise with Chris Hemsworth in the lead? No. Uh, and I love Chris Hemsworth, but even though the Quartermain character was lo around long before Indiana Jones ever was, uh, he still today, remember, he, he only got re revitalized on the big screen with Richard Chamberlain and Sharon Stone because it was a blatant cash grab on the popularity of Indiana Jones at the time. I have the dubious distinction and honor of working on Sean Connery's final film, in which was also the last time we saw Alan Quartermain on film uh, in... Uh, the League, League of, of Extraordinary Gentlemen. What a train wreck that movie was. <laughs> um, so, when right now, it just feels like it would be once again capitalized. Hey, you know what everybody's talking about these days? Alan Are they going to do another Indiana Jones? Let's resurface Alan Gordon. And look, Chris Hemsworth, I believe, is a really solid actor and has charm and charisma. Watch his stint on Saturday Night Live if you get a chance. Mm -hmm. Has a lot of charm and charisma. He could make something kind of cool out of that character, but I still feel like it's just trying to piggyback on the popularity of something else right now. So on that basis, I'm going to sell it. What do you think? I'm going to buy it, but for the reasons that you're saying, I think because he is a movie star and because he could bring something cool to this character. Yeah. I don't know a lot about this character. I like to see more because you know a lot of movies do play off the popularity of other franchises. Most times they do it poorly, but sometimes it's done well. And I think that this could be one of the ones, and I'd like to see because for me, he's one of the he's a movie star you know who can act and sometimes it's just movie stars who are movie stars and you know they're there because they're popular but he's a guy I think has proven that he's got that charisma as a movie star but then you see something like Rush and now it looks like in Heart of the Sea looks something like that cannot wait to see that um, so yeah I, I, I'm curious about it too and, it, and my opinion could change once I see images and, and a trailer and I'm like ah it just looks more like the mummy than it does Indiana Jones but look we haven't gotten a really good Indiana Jones movie since like 1989 <laughs> so um, it, it might fill the void I I'm with you listen I'm, I'm gonna sell this right now 
Because I hope it doesn't come out and like the trailer is some imitation Guy Ritchie movie. Now, if they were to get Guy Ritchie <laughs> on it. A Guy Ritchie directed version, yeah. Alan Porter, that could be interesting. See, I would like that. Yeah. Because when I first saw the trailers for Kingsman, I was like, Ugh, I don't know. Do I buy Colin Firth? as? And then I saw Kingsman. I was like, all right, well, this movie's fantastic. Yeah. This one, it, it, you remember in Jumanji when the dad comes out of the board and yeah. he's shooting that big gun? <laughs> That's what that image kind of looks like. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if like if it's, if it's it just looks like, Hello, I'm Alan Quarterman. I don't even know if he's English. I just went with the English accent there because it seems like an English guy and it's Sean Connery, so it's got to be something English Scottish. I'm selling it right now. I don't know. I, but I what if it was see... German? <laughs> yeah, that's long. That's long. Hello, I'm German. Uh, uh, I... <laughs> Schnell. All right, folks. It is Friday, which means it's time to put uh, our reps on the line here and give you our box office predictions brought to you by our friends at AMC Theaters. Now, this is the part of the week where we simply try to predict what will be, in order, the top five movies at the box office come Monday morning. I haven't uh, participated in a box office prediction in a while. And nice. I gotta tell you, I feel, I feel good about it. <laughs> I feel good about my picks. And here I got one little sleeper in here, okay? okay. Yeah. I, I got a feeling our top three are all gonna be the same. Yeah. I got a feeling our top four are all gonna be the same, actually. But mm -hmm. coming in at number one this week, I'm going way out on a limb <laughs> and guessing Hunger Games, Mocking Jay Part Two, <laughs> will be the number one film at the box office. Coming in second place, it will be the night before. Mm -hmm. We'll take the second spot at the box office. Coming in third will be Spectre. Yes, Spectre will come in third. I believe coming in fourth will be Peanuts. Will be in fourth. And coming in fifth, my little bit of Dark Horse, I believe The Martian is gonna hang in the top five. So mm. once again, Hunger Games, The Night Before, Spectre, Peanuts, the Martian, that is my pick. You look like you have my exact picks. The Close. look on your face. Close. Okay. It's not, I have your Dark Horse, too. I have the Martian at five also, so I'll go. But you, you, your top four? No, order. top four are a little different. Um, okay. I, ha I just, it's very different. I have Hunger Games, obviously, at number one. Uh, number two, I actually have Spectre. And then, oh, okay. then I have Night Before, but but I would not be shocked at all if if Night Before because of, because of the critical acclaim that it's getting so far and the buzz. So, but right now I have that at number three, number four, Peanuts, and then five, The Martian. Uh, I'm gonna start with Secret in Their Eyes. Obviously. <laughs> yeah, <gonna> <laughs> um, no, obviously Hunger Games uh, number one. Throw up the uh, for District Eleven there. Um, I think Spectre is gonna be two, Peanuts three, Night Before four. Mm. And then I'm, I'd love to, people still are seeing The Martian. It's people yeah. are going to see it a second time. I've talked to a ton of friends like, I think this is going to be the weekend we go see Martian because they've just heard so many good things about it. Stick it at five. But All yeah, right. I think the night before is going to. Let's check four, in huh? on Monday and see how well we did. Let me just ask Sinead quickly, which one of us is going to, which one of us do you think is closest? Um, I got to say, I think it's John. I do. Oh, he pays your bills. <laughs> 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 All right, folks, listen, it's that part of the show now for Mailbag. Look, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Now, if you're watching us live right now, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show to take some of your live Twitter questions. How can you send those in? Simply follow us on Twitter at Collider Video and tweet on in a question to us. Sinead will pick out a couple at the end, but for right now, let's get to our Mailbag question of the day. Sinead, what do we got? Zach's Mind writes, was reviewing the episode with Christian Harloff, John Schnepp, and John Campia, where you guys were reacting to the horrendous failure of the latest Fantastic Four movie and the political turmoil between Josh Trank and the Fox execs. It occurs to me that Edgar Wright had Ant-Man taken from him by Marvel and Disney under circumstances that, while not identical, share some similarities with Josh Trank's departure from Fantastic Four. At the time when Wright was removed, it looked like all hope was lost, but Ant-Man worked out despite his removal. Can you help me understand how Ant-Man turned out to be entertaining despite the removal of right whereas fantastic four fell apart from a similar removal of trank yeah a fair question on the surface but but honestly you couldn't have two completely more different scenarios like with ant-man this was a situation where Edgar Wright was on it for years and years and years and years. And what ultimately happened was like he was developing Ant-Man before the as the MCU was just kind of forming and being put together. So that by the time and you know, Marvel liked the idea that he had, but by the time we got around to when Ant-Man was actually kind of almost ready to be made, the Marvel higher ups, Kevin Feige, realized that Ant movie, which we liked four years ago, in theory and in principle, or five years ago, how long it was a long mm. time, in principle. It doesn't fit with this universe we have now. We need to change it and make it a different movie. 
And I totally respect Kevin Feige for that, for wanting to keep the integrity of this of the universe that they have right now. At the same time, I totally uh, admire Edgar Wright for saying, this is the passion project I've been working on. This is the movie I want to make. And I totally admire him wanting to maintain the integrity of the project that he was making. But the decision then for them to part ways happened long before they ever put anything in front of a camera. So that was that situation. The thing with Trank and Fox is that everything really hit the fan once they started shooting the movie. Mm -hmm. That's when it was it was far too late at that point. Like that's when you start having, you know, shooting behind the director's back, the, all this stuff about trouble on set, you know, changing the visual effects supervisor on them, taking away the edit and all that. Like you just had a massive recipe for something that happened while the movie was actually shooting, pulling out key major set piece scenes that were in all the trailers, which we talked about yesterday. Whereas the Ant-Man scenario, totally different. All that stuff got worked out long before they ever put in front of the cameras. By the time they were ready to shoot Ant-Man, they had in stone what their movie was and how it was going to be. And so they're actually two very different scenarios. What am I missing in all this, Christian? How would you see Not it? much. All I would say is that you, you, you guys can guess which pile is which. But right here, you have creative differences, respect, and here you have a toxic pool. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, it's really, that's really what it comes down to because, like you were saying, Marvel knew the direction where they wanted to go and to... No, it, Edgar Wright, like you said, was had this vision of Ant Man, and then things changed because of yeah. all these other movies that just had success. And like, look, we have to go in this direction because this is a story that needs to be told. And he's like, well, I don't necessarily want to tell that story. Okay, great. Then you know, we respect you. You respect us. Everything was nice, yeah. and you yeah, know, very people, amicable. People were upset, but it was fans. It was other people that were upset because everyone loves Edgar Wright. Yeah. But even if he was upset. He didn't go public with it, and he kept it, and he kept a good relationship. As where on the other side of the thing, you had just a property that the studio had no idea what to do with it. Um, it's failed in the past, and then they didn't trust in their director. And it wasn't that Marvel didn't trust in Edgar Wright; it's that they just didn't have the same vision. That's a difference. If because if Edgar Wright would have said, "Hey, look, I, I want to shoot your version of it." They're going to let him shoot the, their version of it and do what he's going to do because the, it's it's Edgar Wright and they trust him. Fox didn't trust Josh Trank and they took whatever he filmed and then just reworked it and did some other whatever the the, the speculation. It sure seems like for all the footage that he shot and stuff that he did that never made the cut, they they didn't believe in him. So it just it was just a pure mess over there as opposed to people who had just had two different versions of what they wanted to do. Yeah, I mean, it's like sports and movies are very similar in a lot of things because you could have the greatest players on the field, but if there's nobody around to lead them or or mm. the GM doesn't believe in the manager and then the manager doesn't want to deal with the GM and then the owner doesn't like either one of them, that toxicity comes down the pipe way quicker than you think in everything, in life, and sports, and especially in a movie and especially a superhero movie. Yeah. And even worse than that, you're talking about a remake yeah. of a... Of a, of a of a couple of movies that really didn't do that well either and were sort of a joke. And this was like a- But they were probably thinking, it can't get any, any worse. worse. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It turns right. out. And, and, and also, Tim's story's going, <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Gotcha. <laughs> you, you have Marvel that runs a heck of a, an organization, right? They Anytime they do something, they want it to be the best it can be. Fox was like, we need to get this out and I don't care how it's done. Uh, and talk behind people's back it, yeah, it's, it was a it's spoiled it, it's it's terrible you know it, it kind of i mean this is a little to home issues like you're so right about that about how sports movies but any organization really that toxicity that you guys are talking about like honestly when like around here um whenever we are bringing or potentially bringing somebody new in the first question we always ask even before talent the first question we always ask is, will this person click right. with what we're doing right. here? And whenever we're thinking about like bringing new people in or increasing somebody, whatever, we like we get groups of us talking like, hey, is this a good fit? Does this work? Because honestly, like we see us laughing up here when we're in our boardroom table, when we're in our office talk, like we legitimately enjoy being here. And we hope that that kind of comes through as well. But but you're at, both of you guys are absolutely right. Like if you don't have that healthy relationship, respect, all that kind of stuff, then you can't expect anything but poison fruit at the end. Well, look, here's a question. If Would you be more surprised? This is just to answer the question right off the bat. Like, if, would you be more surprised if I told you, hey, guess what? Edgar Wright's actually doing another movie with Marvel. Or 
Josh Trank to another <laughs> movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One scenario is a wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I did wouldn't I'm glad that worked The other out. one is a hell freezing over kind of scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god! Yeah. All right, folks. Well, listen. I said we would save a few minutes to take your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So hop on Twitter. Make sure you're following us at Collider Video, and just tweet some questions out to us. You might want to kiss up to Sinead a little bit because she's the one in control right now. So Sinead, what are we dealing Her with? Shirt now? says it all. Boss <laughs> it's lady. true. Um, Gabriel tweets, my book club uses books being made into film. Can you hmm. explain what it means when a book has been optioned? Yes, being optioned, and this has happened, I've had screenplays optioned. I mean, you probably had some stuff optioned mm, step. before too. Yeah, so basically an option basically means like this. Let's say Christian wrote a screenplay, or in your situation, a book, right? And I'm a film producer, and I think, man, <laughs> That's I <a> think... <laughs> Don't you have to read first? Okay, so yeah, that's right. first, shave your mustache. <laughs> so I decide. I read this book. And I'm thinking. I think this thing has potential. Like, but I'm not in a position right now that I'm ready to commit thirty million dollars to make a movie or whatever. But I really like this story. I think there's something I can do with it. So I go to Christian. And I say, okay, how about this, uh, Christian? Let me. I I might want to make your movie, your right. book into a movie. So how about without flat out buying the rights to your to your book, let me pay you ten thousand dollars right now, and that means you cannot sell the rights to this book as a movie to anybody else between now and say uh, March, and I have the option. I am the only one with an option on it. So that means I have the option between now and March that so I can go to Christian and say, okay, now, yeah, I'm ready to go. I'm going to buy the rights to your book now for $150,000, blah, blah, blah. Nobody else can make that deal. Um, so that happens with screenplays a lot. That happens with books a lot. Somebody holds the option that doesn't necessarily mean a movie's getting made. It just means that somebody's interested enough that they want to put on hold. They're basically putting your work on hold, saying, right. hey, I, I want to take that. And then at the end of the day, if I don't make that movie, he still gets to keep the $10,000. Uh, which is a good little thing. I mean, you could look at studios right now. It's small studios, uh, small production companies probably have 30, 40, 50 books or screenplays in option, just an option. Or oh, probably uh, more than that. Yeah. yeah. I, like, even, I'm talking like the smaller ones, you know, they're just sitting on things. And, and the option is usually the shortest amount of time. It's usually like three to four months. And then if they don't exercise the option or they have rights to exercise a longer option, right? Because they want to eventually yeah. buy it. Then they, you can buy, uh, you can buy yeah. the option again. Correct. And then you can buy the option again. I had, I had a screenplay once that was like option like four times in a row by the same by the same guys it's just yeah. an option is there's an option budget yeah you know, yeah you know, it's just like okay this is we want to option this many projects and i mean you nailed it as far as the definition of it but when i was working for joel silver you know it's like we used to things would get optioned all the time through right. the studio and yeah. it was just a matter of well look, and and a lot of the times because it's it's what's what's popular out there okay well look there's a book out there that, that a lot of people haven't read yet this is new that people like we one of the jobs was to go through books that haven't been tapped in yet let's throw an option on it like sometimes even if they're not great to throw an option on certain books to see if you can develop a story out of them that, that work it happens all the time it's kind of like an option is going out to dinner a buy is buying the car and it getting made is like i'm gonna get a house and go on vacation yeah. and, and getting an option is not really that big. like there are th for every one that actually gets picked up there's probably 500 that get options oh, yeah. i've already i've already gotten look without reading a page i've already gotten in inquiries asking if my book has been optioned yet if the, if the option right. rights are still available mm -hmm. and stuff like that so it's like it's not a unique thing uh but that is the first step the way you said it it's mm -hmm. the first step in the process yeah. all right what's next Adam tweets, what would you guys say to touching up the special effects in Jaws rather than a complete reboot? Love you guys. I find Jaws to this day to be one of the most terrifying, scary, <laughs> intense movies I have ever seen and it doesn't need visual effects touch-ups yeah. to do it for me. I am perfectly happy with the way, and this isn't just me going, no, don't touch it. I mean, literally, the way it is scares the hell out of me. So I... I I certainly wouldn't touch it. I mean, I'm fine with somebody rebooting if you want to, but I don't see any need to retouch the visual effects. I mean, if you did something like like we talked about yesterday in Jedi Council with uh, the you know the steel books that just came out, the how right. like the sound and how like it just looks like it just came out yesterday. Um, if you d if you did something along those lines, with the, sure. But yeah, I agree. You don't need to touch Jaws, and you certainly don't need to remake it. I, I am saying because it, it, it's just a movie that does not need to be remade. It's pointless. Well, you, we hope that. The, the Chris Hemsworth um, Moby Dick yeah, movie um, will be as terrifying <laughs> as Jaws. I you say the Chris Hemsworth Alan Quartermain movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> the Moby Dick movie will be anywhere near as terrifying as Jaws. The posters are pretty the terrifying. Posters, yeah. yeah, and the even the, the, the extended the trailer is great. fantastic. Uh, we've talked about it 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea on this show, um, that everything lives up to Jaws. Again, why even remake it? That movie still, if I showed that to a 10-year-old today, he would be just as scared as I was when yep. I saw it at then. You so scared out of your mind last week I watching know. it. Yeah. Oh. Okay. All right, what's next? <laughs> Dusty wants to know what our schedule is going to be like during Thanksgiving week for Movie Talk Jedi Council and Heroes. Oh, I, that's a fair enough question. Yeah, Heroes will be on its regular day. will be on Tuesday. Jedi Council, which is normally on Thursday, will be on Wednesday, so we sneak it in uh, uh, without taking the week off. Then there will be no movie talk on Thursday or Friday, but we will have some videos that we'll be putting up. Uh, we're working out which videos those are going to be right now. Maybe it'll be, you know, a mailbag or something like that, but there will be some programming. But Jedi Council Tuesday is normal. For next week only... Je oh, sorry, Heroes will be Tuesday as normal. Yeah. Jedi Council will be on Wednesday, which we got a little announcement on Wednesday to give you, but nice. hang in tight for that. And then uh, Thursday, Friday, no movie talk, but mailbags and stuff like that will be up uh, afterwards. Thanks for the question. Mark tweets, what about a Gargoyles movie? It was a very smart show with a lot of depth. Animated or live action? I'm not sure how smart it was, but it was certainly a pop. <laughs> it was certainly a, a popular one. It. Hey, look, honestly, when when they started cranking out the GI Joes and the Transformers and things, and for heaven's sakes, Gem and the Holograms, I mean, why not Gargoyles? Right. There, there are some interesting. Look, you don't do an exact uh, adaptation of what the cartoon was, but there's a lot of cool stuff they could do there that doesn't involve I Frankenstein. That could be very cool and look really good and tell a neat story. I, I just wonder if. I kind of feel that with each passing day, the chances of a Gargoyles movie gets less and less. I think the, the further we get away from it, I think the year, the time to make it would have been about five years ago, to be honest. What do you think? I don't know. I think that there's if Voltron ever gets made and when, yeah, Masters, and when Masters of the Universe gets made, those are 80s properties that I think, uh, and I think Gargoyles was like in the 90s, right? Yeah. Um, when when those movies get made, I think it, it's people are going to go back in and say, okay, what, what about Gargoyles? Gargoyles? What about Mask? You know, I yeah. think these, I, I think that you can, yeah, I think you really could develop a show. I don't think it's one of those properties that you're like, well, wait a minute, uh, we've lost the boat on it because I don't, I don't think it's gonna. You're just gonna worry about the audience that is already tuned in because if you put together a good trailer for that, there's people that maybe didn't watch it religiously. Oh, that gargoyles thing was good. Where, where'd that come from? It's oh well, it's actually a popular cartoon back in the day because Gem and the Holograms was so sh far. should have just gone after its core audience yeah. and didn't went after somebody completely different and just missed the mark Yeesh. completely and hit the toilet bowl so it is it's uh yeah not only gargoyles and i mean uh, maybe i'll get a laugh from the but gummy bears that yeah. was a great cartoon Bouncing too. here and there and everywhere. everywhere. I yeah. had no idea there was a Gummy Bear show. Oh, really? Oh, my God. Was? It, was oh, it was great. It was like, do you remember the the, the Robin Hood, the Disney Robin Hood, Hood animated with yeah. Fox? Little yeah. Yeah. Run through the I forest. loved that show. It, that had the same animation style yeah. uh, that that did. Gummy Bears were great. They were yeah. they bounced around the forest. They were kind of bad Does each didn't watch episode that. end with a child eating, eating them one of them? Eating them? No. Yeah, devouring them. But it had an amazing theme song. Had amazing. Really did, I'd be up yeah. for that movie. <laughs> yeah. I would be up for that one. Okay, let's take two more real quick. Cinema Commander wants to know what exactly a, an executive producer does. Uh, takes some money. Yeah. <laughs> or, or, yeah, takes money or uh, raises the money. Yeah. Um, it, look, executive, all the producer titles, all of them, they're, they do carve out a little bit of description, but it can almost mean anything. I mean, it depends on if you're talking about a television, an executive producer on a television show is very different from yeah. an executive producer on a movie. Like executive producer on television, you know very much what that is. That's your showrunner yeah. right there. If you if you got an executive producer on television, in movies, it could be different things. Uh, just like any producer right. title. Steven Spielberg, we talk about this sometimes. Steven Spielberg is the producer on 105, 106,000 films. I lost track. <laughs> um, but a lot of those is just, you wanna make that movie? Yeah, I'm bored. Put my name on it and right. send me a check for you know one hundred thousand dollars. Okay, boom. He's a producer, right. or he or Steve Spielberg will make one call for you right. to get a director on board. You get a producer credit. I mean, gets so, inter international distribution. Traditionally, though, yeah. Christian, what are some of the more generic or or general things that would separate what a producer and associate producer from? An executive producer. So a lot of times it's the money, for sure. Yeah. But I think that the, the difference there is I believe that Steven Spielberg is an executive producer on um, Jurassic World. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, wait, Jurassic World is the most recent one that came out, right? Yes. Not Park. I mean, not World, Lost World. Um, and he, from when we, we spoke to Colin Trevorrow, he said that Spielberg was very involved. And he would talk to, and now, now that might have just been a scenario of just like, hey, Colin, you can call me every, anytime you want. And Colin called him anytime yeah. he wanted. And then Steven Spielberg was really involved. But there are times, like you, like you said, and it happens a lot of the times, because like, I don't know how involved Christopher Nolan was in Man of Steel. Um, they say, and I don't necessarily know. Like that was almost none, right? Yeah. So I mean, that, that's that's picture. that's the that's the exact difference. There's where Spielberg on Lost World, very involved. Nolan not involved at all. So, but like you said, like on TV, you could see upwards of three, four, five executive producers on a TV show. Usually, the first mentioned executive producer is your showrunner or your creator kind of thing, and the next are the people that greenlit it from within the studio or within the production company. Yeah. It runs very different in TV and, yeah. film and yeah, movies yeah. for sure. And yeah. Spielberg's an interesting situation too, because a lot of times, like a studio will say, "Run this by Steven," right? And if Steven will say, "Yeah," so for instance, I remember J.J. Uh, Abrams was at CinemaCon with us in Las Vegas and telling the story about how dis not District Nine. Um, uh, Cloverfield? No, the, the little horror movie Super, Super, 8. 8. Super 8. I knew there was a number in there. Yeah. <laughs> Super 8 got made. And he tells the story. He goes, well, he, they, they said, because he J.J. had the idea for two separate movies. And the studio said, go run it by Steven. <clears throat> so he goes and sits in office Steven Spielberg, and he says to Steven Spielberg, okay, I got these two ideas. One is really imagining the youth that both Steven Spielberg and J.J. Abrams shared, which is getting these Super 8 cameras and running around making movies. It's just a movie that explores the magic of telling stories and making movies with your Super 8 camera. He goes, then I got this idea for this other movie, kind of a horror kind of action movie of a mysterious train coming out of Area 51 and something escapes from it. And Steven Spielberg went, why don't you put the two movies together and make them one movie? And boom, he's an executive like, producer. Right, right, <laughs> and it was right, done. So, right. I mean, there's. Yeah. And that's a true story, by the way. You should yeah. look that up. All right, last question of the day. Dave tweets Can you think of any movie that you were totally into the entire time, but the ending ruined the entire thing? It's a great question. I got to think about it, though. I feel like we talk about at least one every couple of weeks where there's like a, a great movie and then it just completely falls apart at the end. So, I'm, I'm having a hard time picking one out of the top of my think head. About it. But yeah, it was something I'd have to sit down and think about. But. Um, I, I feel like that happens a lot. I feel like it happens. Jack Reacher is one for me uh, that I thought was strong throughout and then had a really weak oh, ending. Oh, uh, easy. Interstellar. Oh, Interstellar is another one. Although I, 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 I really liked Interstellar all the way through, but I, I wasn't. I liked it the second time I saw it. Because the first time I saw it. I, we saw it together. Yeah, and the ending, I was like, what? But when yeah. I watched it again, it made a lot more sense. Um, yeah, I'd have to think about it. Mm. All right, folks. Well, that will do it for us for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing out at our friends' order at AMC Theaters. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and, of course, your movie ticket information. You might have noticed the mustache over here. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Obviously, Josh McCuga is participating in Movember, which Correct. is the growing and maintaining of a mustache. Nice. I am participating in No Shave November, although you'd be hard-pressed to tell. <laughs> um, but this is all about November raising awareness for cancer research. Take one day, today, tomorrow, whatever, and say, you know, I was going to go to Arby's or Chili's or Chipotle, whatever. Instead of doing that, I'm going to take the 16 bucks I was going to spend over there, and I'm going to donate it to cancer research. Very few things you can do that are more worthwhile for your money. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, sitting to my left, Mr. Josh McCuga. Josh, where can people find you online? Uh, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, at Josh McCuga. Like John said, um, my Movember, uh, my MoSpace, donate to the cause. It's, it's really worth it. And here on Collider, the Arrow recap show, the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. recap show, and the Walking Dead recap show. Sitting over here on my right, Mr. Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you? Uh, Twitter and Instagram, at Christian Harloff. And the latest episode of Collider Jedi Council, it's up right now. It's myself, John, and Mark. We talked about a little more of Andy Serkis and Snoke. Star Wars getting a movie every year. It's really, it was a really fun episode. Check it out. Great. Yeah, I should let people know, too, that the first version that went up, I know a bunch of you asked me about this, we put up Jedi Council and the video had audio sync issues. I know like 9,000 of you watched it. Wow. And then we had to put it to private. People were asking me on Twitter, Where, why was it put to private? There is a new version of it up with the audio corrected, so you will find that there. I also want to thank, of course, the boss lady <laughs> sitting over there, Miss Sinead DeFreeze. lady. <laughs> Sinead, where um, yeah. can people find you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram, at Sinead DeFreeze, and at thatsosinead.com. 
And of course, you can find me on the various social media networks. Just follow me on Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. And folks, listen, if you like your entertainment news, make sure you bookmark Collider.com, keeping you up to date on everything going on in the world of entertainment, films, television, everything. The writers over there do such a fantastic job. Bookmark Collider.com today. That'll do it for us, folks. Thanks so much for joining us. My name's John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.